I'm Jim Pinkerton. Welcome to BloggingHeads.tv, a special edition in which the topic is uh, Sarah Palin. And with us to tell us about Sarah Palin and who she is and where she's from is Dave Noon, who is a professor of history at the University of uh, University Alaska. Of, University of Alaska Southeast. Uh, the June South, oh, I, South, okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Okay, let's start right there. Yeah. I mean, we know so little about Alaska. <laughs> Um, so, Dave, this is really, truly, this is, you know, while Palin is still hot and fresh, uh, uh, and i got to watch my puns and double entendres there, um, tell us about where, the state, where she is from. Well, uh, you know, I've, I've been here about six years, and, and it, it's, it, it's definitely the most unusual place that I've ever lived. Um, you know, when, when you're here for the first time, it, you know, you have this experience where, you know, every sentence you could possibly utter becomes suddenly more sort of gravitational by by adding in Alaska at the end of it. So, you know, I'm driving down the road. You know, anywhere else it's pretty boring, but I'm driving down the road in Alaska. Uh, you know, my dog is taking a dump in the front yard in Alaska. And suddenly, you know, it becomes like this, this, this absolutely, you know, sort of, you know, overwhelming thing. But, uh, you know, I, I think that... that you know, in all seriousness, I mean, there's there's something about Alaska that um, has been, uh, I think, aggressively mythologized uh, throughout American culture, and some of this, you know, goes back to the old 19th century, you know, Frederick Jackson Turner kind of myth of the frontier, the idea that Alaska is this place that's you know disconnected from the ordinary you know, processes of modernity, that it's it's a place, you know, sort of a zone uh, where a different kind of liberty is possible. Uh, and I think that in a lot of ways that, that, that there's you know, such it's an exaggeration. In some ways it's just fundamentally untrue. Um, but as far as the mythology of Alaska is concerned, um, and uh, you know, I think Alaskans imbibe a lot of this, um, it, it really comes down to two things. The notion that Alaska is this pristine wilderness, um, this kind of old conservationist environmental ethos that goes back to the 19th century with John Muir and George uh, and then the second one, which is you know, who, who, who is that? John Muir. Who's the second one? Uh, George Bird Grinnell. He was also he was a, a, a anthropologist and a naturalist. He came up here, you know, right around 1899 to do this sort of massive series of, of uh, explorations and, and tours. Actually, it's really the, the first tour ship that that, uh, that comes up here, uh, or among the first. And and it really his his voyages and his publications. Did a lot to promote this idea of Alaska as this, this last frontier, you know. But then, on the other hand, you've got this this uh, uh, sort of counteracting mythology of Alaska as a resource basin, and, and that's the, the drill baby drill uh, kind of approach. And it gets to a fundamental problem that anyone who's ever possessed Alaska, non-natives at least, have confronted, which is how to make this very remote um, landscape profitable. And, and no one who's ever possessed Alaska has, has done a particularly good job of striking a balance between, uh, you know, sort of sustaining the environment of the place, um, you know, while also trying to, to convert it into, to, you know, uh, to bring it into the orbit of civilization. Uh, okay, let's, let's, let's go back on this. I mean, Frederick Jackson Turner was an historian, I think at Harvard, uh, uh, who wrote an a, a, a essay in... 1894 or something like that? Yeah, I think 93. Uh, 93, about the sort of the closing of the American frontier and how now that the Census Bureau has officially declared the frontier closed, I don't know exactly how they arrived at that, but it's, it's a reasonable argument to make, that sort of American history had now changed. We've gone from being a place where you can simply go over the next hill to seek your fortune to a place where you'd have to sort of learn how to live with each other better and so on and so on. And it's an incredibly influential thesis. And, and I guess the question is, is in Alaska, is it still, is it not true? I mean, I, I don't, I mean, you, you hear things like down here, and I, I'm probably one of 90% of Americans who've never uh, set foot in the state right, of Alaska. Right, right. Um, that the federal government owns 96% of the land or something like that? Uh, is that, is that an incorrect, <laughs> um, is that one of those factoids? Well, I'm trying to remember the data. You know, it's, it's, I guess, about 400 million acres of land. The state... I think owns about a hundred and three uh, Alaska natives have about forty four. So I don't think it's ninety six percent. I I should have this data kind of you know mm -hmm. 
at my fingertips, but I don't. But but like, yeah, like a lot of, of you know trans Mississippi western states, particularly the Rocky uh, Rocky Mountain states, uh, uh, you know Alaskans don't control a, a substantial uh, sort of percentage of, of the, the state's territory. Um, uh, so so that and, and I think that you know that gets to this this other you know you know what, what Turner was talking about was this idea of the frontier as a as a place where you could you could escape you know you could you could sort of you know, run away from civilization. You could get, uh, you know, land. You could have the opportunity to, to start over. And, and Turner acknowledged that the 1890 census uh, marked the closing of the frontier. And what he you know, kind of hinted at was that, that Americans were going to kind of recreate the frontier in sort of imaginative ways, uh, you know, so with like Western fiction and, uh, you know, the, the, the whole sort of culture of the, the frontier becomes a way to, to sort of compensate for the loss of the actual frontier. I think that was something that he was... So, so we started doing, we started making movie westerns. Yeah, yeah, and the, you know, the dime novels, of course, are the, the precursors to that. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, that, you know, in a lot of ways that, that this, this, uh, this kind of Western mythology is uh, is very much a part of, of how Alaskans even experience the, the the state themselves. You know, we we live here and yet we're also kind of captive to the mythology of independence. Uh, but the reality, of course, is that we're we're heavily dependent, and that's as I said, been the reality for uh, you know everyone who's ever claimed Alaska from outside. I mean, it was the Russian problem, and that's why they dumped it uh, in our lives. Uh, and it's been an American problem since 1867. Uh, uh, is, pro- is problem the right word? I mean, is it, I mean, is well, the, the, you, think of the, you think of the Russians as like they needed the money, and so they figured they could cash in quicker by selling it to us than by going to exploit it themselves. Right, right, and, and so that's that not a problem. That's more of an uh, asset figuring out how to be utilized. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. I think that's. Uh, I guess maybe you know, conundrum has been a better way to do it. Uh, you know, and the Russians tried to create a a diversified economy, and they they could never do it. Uh, and and the United States has tried over you know all, nearly a century and a half now to to sort of turn Alaska into a, a diversified economy. But the the fundamental reality of it is that. Our economy depends on resource extraction and uh, very particularly, you know, mineral uh, extraction. And, uh, uh, you know, the rest of it comes from, from federal aid. Without, you know, without our dependence on the, on the national government, you know, Alaska wouldn't be, you know, sustainable in the way <laughs> you couldn't have, you know, even 650,000 people like we have here. It, it's just it's a, a very difficult right. place. It, it is interesting. A lot of these a lot of these western states, you know, Mo- I mean, Montana, Idaho, for example, and I realize Sarah Palin, who, was, who is our subject here, uh, uh, went to school in Idaho as well as Alaska. Right. Uh, were heavily unionized, or not, at least reasonably heavily unionized, and therefore kind of democratic. Yeah, um, yeah. It went until, Alaska. Until, until sort of the Eisenhower era, I guess. Uh, yeah. I know. You know, the, I mean, the political reality of Alaska is also very, very strange. Um you know, it's 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 you know heavily Republican now, and it has been for for you know quite some time. I think right around the Nixon era, I think Johnson was the last Democratic presidential candidate to win the state. But uh, but at the same time, the political parties aren't particularly strong here. Alaskan politics has always been driven primarily by by personalities and, and characters, um, and and so you, it, it makes for these very strange. Um, Kind of political dynamics where the parties themselves aren't as significant as the individuals or the coalitions that, that develop around these individuals. In, in, in one party states, so Alaska does seem to be kind of a one party state now in terms of the Republicans, at least until, you know, uh, um, you know whenever. Um, is, are there, is, 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 I mean, is there an identifiable faction, Palin versus anti Palin? I mean, what do they, what do they, I mean, Palin was, when she ran against the, the incumbent governor, Republican Frank Murkowski, uh, uh, two years ago, was she? Was it just her own personality, or did she represent some faction of within the Republican Party against the other faction? Well, uh, I mean, the, the the party reality of it is, of course, that, that Palin was not uh, the preferred candidate of the the, the kind of uh, I guess the you know the, like the, the anchor weight of the, the Republican Party. Uh, you know, she happened to come along at a pretty opportune time uh, because Murkowski was. Uh, a, a, Frankly, it was just horrible, uh, and uh, you know uh, he was he was overwhelmed by intra-party challengers in 2006, and uh, and Palin happened to be the the the, the uh, uh, 
I hesitate to say the default candidate, but but she really didn't. Uh, uh, she was she was able to sort of capture a kind of popular support uh, in lieu of uh, party support. Uh, and I you know I I think it, it's it's tough to say whether she sort of rearranged the, the the party dynamics. She has a lot of folks within the Republican Party who. Who, who really don't like her uh, at all, um, and have, have not had particularly, you know, kind things to say about her. Um, uh, you know, so I, I, I guess I've, I've not really answered the question terribly. No, quite, it. quite. So, so <laughs> is, is it? Is it? Is it? I mean, it, I mean, again, uh, uh, one party states, you, like southern southern states, for example, would typically have a kind of bourbon aristocrat uh, cavalier class. Of you know owners and plantation owners and main streets and so on, and then there'd be a, a rival version of it, uh, which we sort of you know what they in Georgia they call them the wool hat, wool the w o o l hats, you know the rednecks for lack of a better word, right, right. and they would fight each other continuously for power, you know, in state after state after state, and you know in some states like Alabama the wool hats usually won, and in other states like Virginia uh, the Cavaliers usually won. Um, and other states were just would sort of oscillate back and forth. It's, it's, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, when, when when these names were all big cheeses down here because they've been chairman or ranking members of committees for, for you know Don Young, uh, 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 Ted Stevens, uh, Murkowski, who was a senator for you know two decades. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these are all big these are all big fish in Washington. Did they did they represent? Was there an identifiable you know Murkowski, Palin, Stevens wing, or is it just sort of more ad hoc? I, I'd have to say it's more ad hoc. I mean, you know, Palin utilized these folks to the extent that she needed to. Uh, you know, she uh, she endorsed uh, Frank Murkowski um, when he, he ran for governor in 2002 uh, after she lost her bid to, to be the uh, lieutenant governor, um, uh, her, her party's nominee for that position. So she endorsed Frank Murkowski. She, you know, she's, she's endorsed Ted Stevens over the years. Um, and so, to some extent, she's she's uh, uh, you know, by necessity, I think, uh, <laughs> pragmatically, she's had to be kind of a part of that. Uh, you know, but but I think on the other hand, one thing that we see with Palin, uh, what her administration has done, and she's you know surrounded herself with uh, people that really come from Wasilla and come from the Matsu Valley region, which is uh, just sort of northwest of of Anchorage. Uh, and I, I don't know if if that. Really represents a kind of counterweight to the the standard, um, you know, the conventional Republican Party in Alaska, which, as you say, well, let's, been, let's, let's talk about let's talk about that. I mean, I mean, the the, the Wasilla, Alaska is again one of those places where you know tourists and Democratic opposition researchers and reporters are all flocking to now to interview, you know, ex librarians and so on and so on. Is there anything in particular to be said about that town and that ballot? Well, it's 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 a it's the fastest growing region in Alaska, and and it's uh, you know for good or ill, it has mimicked um, you know a lot of what we see in the, the sort of uh, the suburban sprawl, you know, which of course has been been very important to the National Republican Party, you know, over the last couple of, of decades. Um, uh, you know, but it, but it, you know, it, but at the same time, you have a lot of longtime residents of that area who, uh, you know, object to some of the changes that have taken place and some of the changes that that Palin, in fact, presided over when she was was mayor. Um, the rapid kind of big box commercial development, um, I, I think, is, is something that that if you've talked to people who are from Wasilla and are longtime residents, uh, you know, you do find a, a sort of disgruntled faction of people who think that uh, that Palin is, is, is you know not uh, uh, necessarily you know representing the region <laughs> terribly well or hasn't done a whole lot of long-term good for, for, for the region I mean, I mean okay for example I mean I mean you, what you hear the big box development is obviously a hot issue in, in rural areas all over the country uh, I mean the I mean, it's, it's, I mean, if you're involved in zoning, I mean, what else is there to? I mean, what else is there to argue about? I mean, in, in terms of the local politics there. So, I mean, if she was if she was clearly on the side of development and growth and sprawl. I mean, it's, I mean, it is Wasilla. I mean, it's, it's, you, you, you read about it as an exurb, right? And, and, and I mean, is it is there lots of land in between there and 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 um, Anchorage? Yeah, well, it's it's just on the other side of. Um 
uh, 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 Kinek Arm, which is this waterway that, that sort of cuts between the Matsu Valley and, and, and Anchorage. And, yeah, it's a massive area. I mean, Anchorage is, is a, uh, the, the Anchorage region is is one of the most sprawling places that I've ever seen. And I, you know, spent nearly a decade in, in the Twin Cities, uh, Minnesota, which which is uh, you know has terrible problems with, with sprawl. So I've seen I've seen. Uh, Kind of, kind of. You know, there, there's something very familiar when you're when you're out in the Anchorage area. Um, but yeah, I mean, as far as like local local politics there, I mean, I think it's. Um, yeah, I, I haven't spent a lot of time there, so I can't speak very specifically to it. But uh, 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 but I think that, that one of the, one of the, the the sort of interesting things about Palin's nomination uh, that I just I I, I, I kind of find it kind of weird. I'll, say, I, you know, I'll get your thoughts on this. Um, there's this kind of Romance that we have for small town political experience, and you know these kind of quaint uh, narratives about someone sort of rising up through city council to the mayor's office and then onward and upward. But uh, you know something that, that the bloggers over at Rust Belt Intellectual have been writing a lot about, which is this idea that small town politics politics is, is you know pretty petty and pretty nasty. Um, you know, so. Uh, I don't, I don't quite understand why we, we kind of fixate on, you know, the, the small town politic as being this, this kind of, like, ideal alternative to whatever partisan nastiness we, we you know, want to get away from. As opposed to big town parties, partisan nastiness. I mean, I, look, I, I, the, 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 the thing that I keep thinking of with, with Wasoa, Alaska as a phenomenon is Plains, Georgia. Uh, in 1975 and 1976, was Jimmy Carter... Uh, resident of Plains got hot, both as a no- nominee and then, of course, as the ultimately victorious presidential candidate. Um, I was in, I was in college back then, and I can remember friends of mine who were just you know political types would drive you know down uh, over uh, I was still in California uh, to see Plains, Georgia, and to hang out and so on. And of course, they, they were met by uh, lots of reporters and you know, I suppose a few Republican opposition researchers, and, and of course, lots of Mr. Haney types. If you remember Green Acres, you know, were more than happy to sell. You know, Plains, Georgia, tchotchkes and so on. Uh, you know, uh, you know, bottles of peanuts and everything else. And the overwhelming, you know, uh, takeaway was: here's this cute little town full of nice little people, uh, in, a, in, a, in a good sense. Who, and then I, in, a, in, a, in a sort of a less Googleable era, you sort of never really know that, you know, America's uh, Plains and Americas and Sumter County, Georgia, were hardcore. Uh, uh, Goldwater country, hardcore George Wallace country. Um, you know, they, they were, they were. You know, uh, you can have respect for those positions, but the point is, they were not the kind of liberal integrationist. Uh, uh, you know, uh, ethnic Switzerland that that say Johnny Apple, the late Johnny Apple, the reporter for the New York Times, uh, uh, would present it as. I would say, I think it's fair to say that sort of the American people were kind of fooled. By a friendly press that presented Plains, Georgia, as this nice place, and of course, you know, when when Jimmy Carter became president, even his most fervent admirers would admit that he was a little bit on the petty side, a little bit on the uh, you know dogmatic and flinty side. And I suppose if a, a more searching examination of his record as a state senator uh, from Georgia and then as a, a one-term governor would have probably revealed more of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I mean. Uh, uh, I, 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 you know, the way you describe that, you know, it certainly does ring uh, familiar with with uh, what's been sort of coming out regarding Palin's uh, time in in the mayor's office in Wasilla, uh, and some of the local, um, you know, really just the the, the, the pettiness of, of some of the politics and some of, uh, of course, the, the things that have been widely reported. Uh, you know, allegations about uh, you know, particular uh, uh, policies that you know, Palin tried to pursue, or the way that she sort of you know, dealt with personnel matters. Uh, you know, a lot of this stuff, I think, is. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know to what extent most people outside of Alaska actually care about that. Uh, it's one of the interesting things for me experiencing this. Uh, you know, kind of in a, in a very local way. I just, I don't know, I, I know what matters to Alaskans, and I know that the Alaskans are, are talking a lot about this stuff, and I, I you know, blog at a couple of places, and it's, you know, it, I, I know that it's part of the conversation, but I don't know to what extent the larger kind of, you know, American observers 
uh, really care to get into that stuff, or whether they well, I'm not sure how much they care either. But I do know they care about Palin. Yeah. I mean, so whatever whatever forces shaped her, they are, uh, uh, what they're interested in is the final the final product. Yeah. So I mean, it, it, uh, let's start let's let's start with the, sort of uh, as you see it. I mean, what should Americans know about Sarah Palin? Um, the one thing that I, I, I keep coming back to, and I've talked with colleagues about this, I, I, and I, this is going to sound sort of overly pessimistic about the, the place of Alaska in the larger national um, kind of scene, but I think uh, by virtue of, of the, the political realities and the economic realities of Alaska, uh, I think it's, it's very difficult for someone coming from Alaskan politics to develop a broader national vision that, that would be of any use in, in governing uh, on a, a, you know, in, say, the executive branch. Uh, Alaskan politics is about, you know, getting access to resources, uh, natural resources within the state, because that's how we fund uh, the state government. And on a national level, uh, as everyone's sort of been been uh, made familiar uh, with by you know the excesses of Don Young and Ted Stevens, uh, Alaska's congressional delegation has always been devoted primarily to, to delivering uh, federal resources to the state. Um, there's a very skeptical kind of outlook that, that Alaskan, and not all of them, but but uh, but you know most Alaskans and, and Alaskan political leaders have toward. Uh, this kind of outside world. Uh, there's a feeling that Alaska is a very young state that deserves uh, federal support uh, disproportionately to other states. Uh, and, and there's, there's a, I think, a feeling that, that Alaska's needs have to come first. And I think that, that Palin, if you look at her overall record, uh, you know, that, that's uh, you know, firmly the tradition in which she's been embedded. Uh, as mayor, she wanted to, to get resources for, you know, her her region. Uh, as governor, uh, you know, there's there's been, you know, wide accusations, uh, you know, by people in her own party that, that she's shown kind of favoritism toward the Matsu Valley, where she's from. Uh, there's there's no evidence that I can see that she's ever you know, spent a lot of time noodling about national issues, uh, and I think that, that some of that's becoming you know, strikingly obvious as as she's um, uh, very very tentatively kind of presented to a, you know, the national press, um, and as she's put in situations where she's not being. Uh, you know, offered words written by someone else. Uh, I, I right. So, so they take those two points. One that they, people, the economics of Alaska are extraction oriented, which puts, I guess, puts them in conflict with the environmentalists, and certainly Anwar, which is certainly an issue that everybody has wrestled around with over the last, uh, uh, I guess, few decades now. And the other is a certain orientation toward, you know, a, sort of a Mississippi approach to. You know, elect them young and keep them there forever until they get seniority, so they can uh, bring home the bacon or the pork uh, back home. Um, I mean, are there, are there any issues? I mean, that that that's that sort of na what would be if you had to put well, that's too kind of, that's not quite right. What national issues do sort of people penetrate? I mean, do people talk about Iraq? Do they talk about the subprime mortgage? I mean, I mean, what what has is there some different? Is, they surely they're they can watch CNN at least to get some. Yeah, yeah. Sense of what's happening down here? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't mean to, to suggest that the people in Alaska don't think about these these larger things just as a matter of course. But I'm thinking very very narrowly in terms of the, the you know the governance of Alaska and the you know the, the kind of pragmatic political culture that we have. Um, I think that, that a lot of those 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 larger issues don't necessarily um, uh, you know outweigh uh, the, the you know local concerns, and that's that's of course to be expected, but. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, certainly you know, by virtue of the fact that we we, we um, you know have a, a large uh, sort of military uh, presence in the state, um, you know, issues like the Iraq War have, have been uh, a part of the state's conversation. You know, when when uh, it got to the point where where several of these uh, uh, sort of National Guard units that were made up of, of Inupiat and Inuit um, folks way way up north. They, you know, these are folks that, that, that uh, you know, primarily joined the National Guard in order to sort of add to their, their kind of subsistence and very, very minimal cash economy. Uh, you know, and so they, of course, it's the risk you take when you join the National Guard, but they got shipped off to Iraq a, a couple years back, and that was a big deal. Uh, for I, I think the, temp the temperature, I mean, you know, uh, I, I've been to Iraq. Uh, I was there when it was 126. Yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah, um, yeah, you know, but, the, uh, uh, but, but yeah, so I, th- I think that, the, the, you know, we, we've got this, this very strange relationship politically and economically with, with the, the rest of the country. Uh, and I, I'm just, I, I, I find it somewhat implausible to think that, uh, that someone like Sarah Palin um, could be, uh, you know, prepared uh, for the kind of role that, that she's conceivably, you know, going to have to fulfill. I just, I, I think that that's, that's, a, that's a real stretch, uh, just as, as, a, as a political observer uh, here in Alaska. Just right, we'll, we'll hold that thought for one second. Sure. Just out of curiosity, how far is, is, is Juneau from, from Canada? How far is the Canadian border from you? Uh, not far. If, if I were willing to climb through ice fields, I think it's, it's a couple, uh, uh, at, at a certain point, just a few miles away. That's what, that's what I thought. So, I mean, is the Yukon, is the, is, it's the Yukon territory that's next to you, right? Uh, I think right across the border from us, where it's, um, yeah, I think it is, I think it's the Yukon. Is it, is it, I mean, is the political culture, I mean, obviously it's a different country, but I mean, it just, uh, just, is this, is the, are these sort of political issues there too? I mean, I mean, is it a sort of, I mean, it, it, one would imagine that the economics of Yukon, in terms of extraction and so on, are pretty similar to Alaska. Yeah, I'm um, embarrassed to say that I don't know uh, okay, all that much okay. about it. <laughs> but, uh, all right, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, okay, let's go back to let's go back to Alaska. I'm, I'm just kind of curious because you know, you, I mean, sometimes you you can learn a lot from you know these sort of international comparisons. Of, you know, like like for example, I mean, for example. You know, Manitoba and Saskatchewan are a lot like you know North Dakota and so on. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, so I mean, uh, so when did you first? When did Palin first burst on the scene, as far as you were concerned? Two thousand six, when when she was running. I I I, I think, um, you know, she had been in the uh, sort of turnstile of conversation about possible um, uh, uh, you know, Senate. Um, uh, Candidates, you know, when Murkowski decided he wasn't going to, you know, he was going to, you know, run for governor in, in 2002, um, her name was floated as someone whom Murkowski might tap as his his successor. You know, but of course, Murkowski chose his daughter instead. Uh, you know, she made a bid for lieutenant governor uh, uh, that year. Um, uh, you know, so so she had been kind of mentioned, but it, it, for me personally, it wasn't until the the 2006. Um, Republican primary race that, that uh, I became familiar with with her, um, so, mm. so pretty recently. Gotcha. So so when you when you watched her give the acceptance speech in St. Paul, what were you thinking? Um, I you know I kind of uh, you know you, you mentioned uh, by email this this uh, this piece that Jim Albrecht had written for for Slate, and the point that he was making was that. Uh, you know, Sarah Palin on a national stage is is a very different kind of character than uh, you know uh, than than or, or represents the state in a very different way than the state actually is. And and what he meant by that is you know her job in this uh, in that that role and at that moment was to be the um, uh, the base rallier and to, to be the culture warrior and. Uh, and so when when I when I heard those those that, that, those parts of the speech, um, you know, there did seem to be something very 1994-ish about uh, uh, the tone that she was taking and the the words that, that she was being asked to, to speak. Um, it's it's it, it was a very different Sarah Palin than than what we've typically seen as governor. Uh, much more ideological, um, uh, or uh, her her ideological. Kind of character kind of came out a little more in that speech, uh, so I found I found it was it was it was certainly bizarre, uh, you know, to, to, to witness that. Uh, Are you, so you're saying she's she was more ideological on the national stage than she is back she was back in Alaska. Well, because because the perception is she, to win a Republican primary you got to run you, you sort of run to the right and and all the sort of news reports about her church and so on have have have, have given people down here the impression that. This is what she was like up there. Yeah, well, and I think she, she is. is. I mean, I, I think that, that her, uh, the, the political reality of Alaska is, is it's, it's a very pragmatic political culture. And uh, Sarah Palin, uh, as governor, has not been as overtly ideological as I think she might be in a different political environment. Uh, I think that, I think that, that is, she's, she's a, a real, you know, genuine social conservative. And, you know, we know, uh, uh, you know, from... You know, so talking to people who have been around her in in private or behind the scenes as a public figure, we we know that she she bears a lot of you know this, this ideological 
uh, uh, weight. And uh, you know, but but as a as a as a governor, she hasn't really been able to. Uh, because the legislature won't allow her to to pursue these kinds of policies, and and most Alaskans really really wouldn't, you know, uh, you know, feel like being detained by the kind of social conservative policies, um, you know. So I think that, that as you know, as a, as a person, she's she's extremely conservative, um, but as a as a as a governor, the circumstances have have not enabled her to be or to to govern as conservative as I think she would she would probably prefer. So, okay, that's interesting. I mean, I mean, I mean uh, pre Palin, Alaska had sort of, rep- I mean, and pre Ted Stevens, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Alaska had sort of a reputation as being sort of libertarian. You know, I mean, the Libertarian, Par- libertarian Party was relatively strong there. I think they actually elected a state legislator there one time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- I, a little fuzzy on this. You guys decriminalized marijuana, at least you did for a while. Uh, yeah, um, I can't. <laughs> that's probably, I mean, that's probably a good thing. That and, 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 and so maybe now, sort of the old hippies who became libertarians in their old age have sort of died off or something, and been replaced by people with Christians with big families. Well, I think I think it's actually it's, to some extent that that's true. I mean, certainly the um, uh, the, the development of the, the the oil and gas, uh, the oil resources in the seventies, the construction of the pipeline brought a tremendous flow of people from. Uh, from Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana, uh, and, and and it brought with it, um, I think, a, a very different kind of of conservatism. Uh, I mean, Alaska's always been you know, had this kind of libertarian streak, but it, as I said earlier, it's a dependent libertarianism, uh, it li- like libertarians that couldn't survive without massive, you know, federal aid. Um, sort, of, sort of like Wall Street. Well, yeah, yeah, precisely. It's a, it's a dependent individualism, uh, and and. Uh, and I think that that's always been a part of Alaska's culture, uh, even even among you know a lot of the, the progressives. I mean, you find that there's, a, there's definitely a libertarian streak among Alaskan progressives that's different than what you're, you're going to find uh, elsewhere in the country. Um, uh, but uh, uh, but but yeah, so I think I think that that, that Palin is a part of, of something that is fairly new um, uh, to Alaska, uh, you know, as far as uh, social conservative uh, ideology is concerned. And, and the legislature, and, and, and the, as the legislature reflecting this change, or is it still, you made it, made it sound like they, they were sort of, uh, at least on the social, on social stuff, to the left of her, um, the, the state legislature. And maybe not to the left of her, but just, just uh, uh, you know, not really driven uh, to, to act on this stuff. Like, for example, I mean, abortion politics play a role in, in state affairs, and, and we, we've had... You know, sort of, you know, rounds of, of legislation that have been struck down by the state supreme court. Uh, 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 you know, or or you know, we had our kind of conversation about uh, you know uh, 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 domestic partner benefits for gay and lesbian couples, um, and and that sort of got resolved. And, you know, so so social conservative, uh, you know, social issues do play a role in the legislature, but but. Uh, but generally, you know, it's it's dominated by uh, you know some questions about just, you know what to do with all the oil money that we've been. Now, how, how much money did, did, did they, I mean? I, I, I see these different numbers, but how much money people have gotten uh, uh, or people get a year from the from the state of Alaska government? It's it's based on a formula, and and if I were you know smarter about economic matters, I could explain it to you. But basically, there's a five year lag, uh, so the the the. Um, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the refunds that we, or the, the dividend payments that we just got, were based on oil prices from several years ago. So, so there's some sort of formula that they use. The amount of the dividend payment changes from year to year. In the six years I've been here, it's it's anywhere from like 850 to about two thousand dollars, which is what it was this year. So it now, there's, there's, there's still a sales tax and an income tax and so on. Or are there? uh, there's no income tax. Uh, okay. We have uh, and there's no state sales tax. There there are uh, a, a variety of, of mostly regressive state taxes on alcohol, cigarettes, and gambling. Um, but we, we don't have a, a state income tax. Uh, we, we we couldn't even pass a one percent say uh, state income tax about five six years ago. So um, most of the most of the state revenue comes from oil. Eighty percent of it, uh, wow. give, or, give or take. Um, yeah, and and right now, I mean, the state is is absolutely overwhelmed with with money. Uh, we've got a, a five billion dollar surplus at, at the moment, which is just insane. For for, for seven hundred thousand people. 
Uh, even less than that, I think about six hundred and fifty thousand. Um, wow. and, and that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it, and I think it's it's one of the reasons that that um, you know Palin uh, is 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 popular right now. I mean, she she has the good fortune to be the governor of a state that that's swimming in in money, and uh, I think that that. You know, and the, you know the fact that that she and the legislature got together and, and provided about a billion dollars worth of, of energy relief to Alaskans uh, is, is you know, certainly something that, that matters. So how, 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 did that, how did that come? I mean, I mean, I mean, this is that sound sort of big governors to me. How, how did how did they pay down, or how did they help people with their energy prices? Uh, the, the the short version is that we all got uh, uh, twelve hundred dollar. Uh, uh, stipends uh, attached to our permanent fund dividend this year. So, so um, uh, if you were a, a, a full-time resident of Alaska for the calendar year 2007, you just got, in addition to your $2,000 permanent fund per person, uh, you got an additional $1,200. Uh, so someone like Palin's family, uh, $18,000, $19,000, um, uh, Trigg, the youngest one, wouldn't get it because he wasn't here for so the eighteen eighteen nineteen thousand dollars for what? I'm sorry. Uh, for Palin's family uh, would have gone. No, so, so, so five people would get eighteen or nineteen thousand dollars. Yeah, so about, per day? this year it was like three thousand dollars per person. Yeah, so a family right. of five would would you know get you know, fifteen thousand. So this probably more than wipes out anybody's tax burden, right? Uh, not, it, not, any, not anybody's, but I mean, you know, not not Vega Oil or whatever that company that was allegedly bribing Ted Stevens, but um, Vico, yeah, yeah, but <laughs> but. But the, your average, I mean, I mean, if, if well, I mean, if, if you make fifty thousand a year or seventy-five thousand a year in, in Alaska, and there's no income tax, there's no state sales tax, it's sort of hard to imagine how. I mean, you're, you're, you know, again, this is a great, great, great system if you can if you can swing it, which is to say, the government pays you to live there. Yeah, in in effect, yeah, you know, because of course it's it's uh, you know taxes on oil revenues that that, that fund um, the government, and it, that's why we had the surplus, and that's why we were able to you know all get this this uh, extra uh, extra flow of cash. Uh, you know, on the other hand, the, the, the offsets are, are are pretty huge. I mean, Alaska is an extraordinarily expensive uh, state to live in. Um, uh, for rural Alaskans, uh, you know, which. Uh, you know, is primarily native. Uh, and I should say this: uh, when people use the word "native" in Alaska, and you, down in the lower 48, and you hear people talking about natives, and it sounds very strange. But yeah, it, it's you know, Alaska natives are uh, well, primarily the residents of the rural areas, and and there, there's there's uh, uh, you know, for many of these folks, um, you know, those dividend payments are are the only, or it's a major source of, of their their cash economy. Um, yeah, so I, I don't mean to. to uh, it, it's important to clarify kind of what the, the you know what all these revenues do and don't do. Um, I think a lot of folks in the lower 48 uh, or, or the lower and western 49 have have an image of Alaska as kind of you know people just sort of dancing in piles of money uh, every year, but uh, it's it's not quite as as, as lucrative as that. <laughs> but but if if you do, you're not going to tell anybody down here. No, no, precisely. And you know, and you know, get back. You mentioned Anwar. I mean, this this is of course one of the reasons that that nearly everybody in Alaska supports development in Anwar. I'm I'm a minority, a, a huge minority, that I, I don't support it. But uh, you know, it, it, I'm I'm perfectly willing to accept. Uh, you know, if people in the lower forty, if you guys want to send me and everyone up here more money, you know, by all means. Um, uh, do so. Uh, you don't have to develop. Well, the, the reason the reason I, this comes up is because, as as you know, just uh, today's uh, uh, Wednesday, just just last night, the the, the Democrats caved in on uh, offshore oil drilling. Yeah, yeah. For for the for the rest for I, I guess the rest of the country and also oil shale. So in other words, I mean it, it's nothing is finished yet, but one can reasonably surmise, given the. Enormous political shift that's occurred in the era of, of, of you know four dollar gas prices. Uh, that there's going to be a lot there's going to be a lot of drilling um, you know off the east and west coasts of the United States. And I don't, I don't think any American had any idea uh, the estimates as to how much you know oil and gas there is in these places that hasn't been touched. Yeah. And I think that one of the upshots of the just the, the 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 surge in interest in Alaska, both with Ted Stevens just as, a, as an earmarking Hall of Famer. Uh, plus whatever else, and Don Young, and now Palin has gotten people thinking. Hey, you know, if, if there is, you know, a, a, a billion or a hundred billion or a trillion dollars worth of oil 
uh, off the coast of North Carolina, uh, then why don't we drill it and take the money? Now, again, this is obviously not uncontroversial, but I do think that the, the, the politics of energy have shifted pretty dramatically in sort of the drill, drill here, drill now, pay less direction. Yeah. And a lot of, I think a lot of politicians and, and, and matter, citizens are thinking to themselves, you know, wow, it would be kind of nice if the government sent me a check for two or three thousand dollars a year. Yeah, um, but I, 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 you know, the, the Alaskanization, if I can coin a term, of, of American energy policy, I don't, I, it, it, it's not my area of expertise, so I'm just going to swimming off, uh, you know, the deep water here. But, uh, but it, it, what it, it strikes me is, is, is uh, yeah, Alaska's natural resource model is, is really not. I think for, for ecological reasons, it's not a good model for the rest of the country. But uh, but I think uh, economically speaking, um, I, I would find it very difficult to imagine, uh, you know, say, a, a national uh, kind of, uh, uh, sort of quest for something like the Alaska Permanent Fund. Uh, I, th- I think that the, the resistance to uh, sort of taxing oil companies in a way that would, that would fund this sort of thing is probably not... Um, uh, it was probably. I mean, I think the resistance would be too great to that on the national scale, just because it, you know, it feeds into this this uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, you know, con- conservative animus toward toward taxation. You know, a lot of what happens in Alaska is it doesn't seem particularly conservative. Uh, you know, Palin comes in. You know, she she and the legislature raise the taxes on the oil companies. Um, uh, you know, just sort of distributing these these massive you know, surplus bonuses. Uh, you know, redistributing corporate wealth essentially uh, to ordinary uh, citizens. Uh, I, I just I don't know if that's like a, a, a real viable fantasy for for most Americans. Um, well, I, I think I think we're seeing you know some pretty heavy you know timber being moved around, and, and uh, a, as the Republican Party becomes more populist and more red state, and, and, and frankly, from an economic point of view, downscale. I mean, I've all the, you know, John Kerry carried uh, 16 of the 24 most affluent uh, counties in the country in 2004, and I've seen several polls now that show uh, people with incomes over $75,000 per year are, are voting pretty solidly for Obama, uh, leaving people in the middle to, to, to vote for McCain. Um, you know, one, it, it's pretty easy for me to imagine, at least, that, that any Republican uh, it's not just a, a hardcore, pure, you know, Ayn Rand libertarian who say, "Yeah, this is this is this is free money. Let's take it." Uh, uh, you know, the oil companies will do just fine. I suspect that no oil. I mean, I'm sure the oil companies scream bloody murder um, when they went. I, mean, I assume so. You tell me uh, when they raise their taxes. Yeah, but it yeah. seems to me they're, they're still doing it. Yeah. Um, and well, it, actually, you know, I, 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 you know uh, again, this is this is sort of you know out of my depth a, a little bit, but but what I what I do read um, uh, on the the oil issue is that uh, you know, some of the critics of Palin, some of her her you know uh, conservative critics in the state, basically are arguing that uh, uh, that yeah, the oil companies have basically you know stopped uh, because of these taxes. And, yeah, they may be hyperventilating on this, but. Yeah, you know, they they say, well, you know, look what happens. The taxes you know, sort of get raised, and then you know the oil companies kind of kind of halt, uh, uh, you know, some of the movement that they might be making on the North Slope, or or you know, uh, they raise the taxes, and now the oil and and gas producers are not participating in this pipeline project that Palin's been been touting uh, all over the country. So I, I think that they, you know, you, you could make an argument that it is indeed, um, you know, kind of. Uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe something that uh, you know isn't working out quite as well as as uh, uh, a Palin and, and a lot of her supporters claim it is. I I, I can't say for certain, but uh, no, that that of course was the original argument of the Laffer curve, which is at some point that the rate on tax a tax rate comes high enough that it becomes counterproductive, and yeah. it would be yeah. you know it usually is associated with income taxes, but yeah. maybe I, I'm sure there's an application uh, for re- for resource taxes too. It would be it would be interesting to see whether. Um, you know, uh, capital invested in uh, new exploration and so on is, is declining. And, and you know, if they opened up, if Anwar is a is a federal land preserve, does the state still get money from it if they open it up? Yeah, and I, I wish I could remember the percentages on that. But but yeah, we you know Alaskans would would benefit from that. Uh, uh, you know, and and Alaskan support for drilling in Anwar, I think, it depends on that. Uh, but also. 
uh, you know, there's, there's of course real anxiety about jobs uh, in the state. It's, it's it, we, we're we're such an undiversified economy. Um, I think most Alaskans uh, are perfectly comfortable with the idea that you know whatever the the, the ecological costs or the, the marginal economic benefits of drilling an animal are, uh, and I think that that you know, uh, you know those are the things that are certainly worth keeping in mind. But I think most Alaskans are perfectly comfortable thinking about Anwar as, as a massive public works program, you know, just, just waiting to happen. Um, you know, which, which is again one of the reasons it has so much support is that uh, uh, there's a there's a real fear. I mean, production on the North Slope, Prudhoe Bay, has been you know in a, a kind of a, a downward uh, trend on a downward trend, uh, and there's real anxiety that at some point the major source of private uh, uh, sort of employment uh, is going to be is going to disappear. Hmm. Um, well, uh, right. Uh, who knows? Uh, it, it, have you ever thought of yourself as an expert on Russia because Alaska, and I keep reading Alaska borders <laughs> Russia, and it doesn't border Russia, right? Unless I completely misapprehended the map. I mean, there's a, there's a there's a Bering Strait. Yeah, yeah, Russia yeah, yeah. Alaska. There's that that little that little you know uh, 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 sort of strip of water between us. Um, right. But uh, no, I mean, and it's. I, I got to say, that's just just kind of one of the most comical things I've ever heard. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the the idea that somehow proximity uh, you know, through osmosis generates a, a familiarity or a, you know the kind of um, apprehension of um, uh, what what you know, so international relations would, would involve. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you know, in seriousness, I mean, there, there is this historic relationship between Alaska and, Ru- and, and Russia, but uh, but that's that's really about it. You know, we have other other Russian. I mean, there, there's a significant Russian ethnic population. Yeah, yeah, there's a sizable group. I mean, we have quite a few actually at, at, at my university. Um, you know, students uh, that, that come over, uh, mostly from from eastern eastern Russia. Um, oh, 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 they're not. They're not. I'm not. I was, talking, I was actually asking about sort of linger. Uh, you know. Ethnic holdovers from when the Russians owned Alaska. Oh, you're oh saying, I see. You know, yeah, a little bit, uh, not a whole lot. You mean you see the evidence of the, the, the old Russian architecture in Sitka, which right. was their capital, but um, and and the Russian Orthodox Church is is a, a plays a, a, an enormous uh, cultural role uh, for Alaska natives um, uh, around the state. Really? But yeah, yeah, yeah. They they were um, uh, you know it, you know long after the the. Uh, the Russians sort of discharged the territory. Uh, you still had a, a large Russian Orthodox uh, presence in here. And so there's a fascinating history there, the relationship between the Russian Orthodox Church and the native populations versus the, the Protestant missionaries that came from the U.S. Um, uh, those groups took very, very different approaches to... Uh, uh, how, how so? Just, I mean, it's considering the fact that Todd Palin is part, you know, whatever he is. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, what well, the, 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 the thumbnail sketch is that the, I mean, the Protestants, in a, in a kind of typically you know Protestant fashion, uh, if you look at the larger history of Protestant Native uh, or Protestant American Indian interactions, the Protestants came in and, and sought to totally transform the culture, and they established boarding schools. They, uh, you know, aggressively tried to eradicate Native languages, uh, substitute Protestant, uh, you know, particularly uh, Presbyterian and Episcopal um, uh, kind of practices for for Native. Uh, you know, religious traditions. Uh, whereas the, the the Russian Orthodox Church, because of Russians, uh, Russia's very you know always like minority presence. Uh, you know, they they claimed the territory, but they were always like a, you know the, at the at the mercy of, of uh, uh, you know much of the the state's native population. And so they had the, the Russians in a way kind of had to assimilate themselves to native culture if they wanted to transform uh, or wanted to to sort of, you know convert. Um, you know, Alaska's native. So they, they did things like they, you know, they, they learned the native languages and they, they translated, uh, 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 you know, the, the Bible into native languages and they didn't try to stamp out uh, the native religious practice and, and cultural practices as much as the Protestants did. So, so anyway, there's a long history there. and it, it so, so, so a lot of these, for lack of a better word, Eskimos, I and mean, I guess that's probably not politically correct to say that, but, but they're... they're, they're but, Attendees today are, are, are members of Russian Orthodox parishes. Yeah, particularly in, wow. in uh, like say Western Alaska uh, and kind of like South Central Alaska. Um, uh, around in Southeast Alaska, you know where Juneau is, uh, uh, the the Protestants were a lot more active, and so there's less of a Russian Orthodox 
influence, but definitely you know, the farther north you get, um, uh, you, you see the, the, the Russian Orthodox influence. And, and, yeah, and like I said, it's, it's, it's a really interesting aspect of, of the, the right. state. So, so why would a Russian today, a, a teenager uh, from Russia, come to want to go to school in Alaska? Uh, <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I, I think I mean, they haven't had enough of cold. I mean, you know. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you you got me. Uh, 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 a lot of them come over and, and do business degrees, um, uh, and I think that, that you know there's, there's their family ties. Uh, you know, there, there's a, 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 a you know reasonably sized Russian population in the Anchorage area, uh, and so I think that, that that plays that plays some role. But beyond that, who knows? Mm. Um, is, is there much bilingual? I mean, I've always mentioned ethnic language, uh, native languages, and so on. Is there, is there much? Is there, bi- is there bilingualism? Is there any attempt to keep these languages going in terms of the schools and so on? Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, we, we've got a, uh, you know, at, at, at UAS, we've got a um, Alaska Native Studies minor, uh, and we have a, a lot of folks uh, from the Clinket and Haida uh, communities that, that come in and do. Sort of language recovery projects, and those are ongoing around the state. The native corporations um, also uh, do a lot of kind of cultural uh, recovery. Uh, well, what's a native corporate? I mean, like like reservations? Oh uh, no, actually, we don't have reservations here. It's it's again one of the peculiarities about the state. Um, when when Alaska became a state, uh, they basically had to, to uh, uh, settle uh, native land claims and. Um, uh, there were no reservations. Well, there was one very, very, you know, uh, southern tip of, of, uh, of southeast Juneau or southeast Alaska. Uh, but uh, throughout the state, you know, no reservations whatsoever. And so in order to, to um, develop the oil resources, the state had to settle um, uh, the, the native land claims. And so in 1971, they did that. And basically the, the mechanism for settling the land claims was that uh, Alaska native communities were, um, uh, were given – about 44, 45 million acres of land, and they could use that land to develop the resources to, um, uh, you know, kind of you know, maintain their villages. And they did that by establishing corporations. So all of the, the, the there's a, a patchwork of native uh, uh, corporations that have been in existence for about, you know, 40, almost 40 years now. Can, can they have casinos? Uh, they, they do, there's no casinos, but there's, uh, they, they do, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there there are some like pull tabs and, and other kinds of very light uh, sort of gambling sort of thing. But mostly the, the the native corporations are, you know, they deal with uh, they do a lot of tourism. So for example, in Juneau, the Gold Belt, which is one of the native corporations, they own a lot of the um, uh, 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 they do a lot of like the you know, the tours. They own hotels. They own uh, uh, the they've got like a tramway that people can take up to the the top of. The, you know, the largest mountain in this area, and uh, so they do a lot of that. They do a lot of natural resource development, uh, a lot of timber, uh, a lot of fishing. Uh, so these would be corporations with sh- the shareholders that are based on sort of ethnic ethnic identity of some kind, right? Right. Yeah. Right. The, and, the, the, and so you could just be living in a in a tract house and just happen to be a one part whatever part percentage it is owner of this company. Yeah, the, the, I, I, I can't remember. How, I mean, the share, the distribution of shares really depends upon the corporation itself. I mean, they, have, they set up their own rules and, and so on. But, uh, but, but uh, uh, as far as the, the, the proportions go, I'm not sure, you know, kind of how that, how that shakes out. But, um, but yeah. I mean, but that, this, that, this, that, this must lead to some pretty heavy sort of uh, corporate management issues. I mean, if you've, got, if, you've, if you've got a bunch of people who are basically inherit, inherited a corporation, you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying they didn't deserve it, but I'm saying in terms of just sort of one day they woke up and realized that they were, uh, you know, one, let's say one one hundredth owners of a, a, a copper mine or a, a tramway or a hotel or something like that. I mean, that must make some pretty complicated uh, Politics, just in terms of yeah, the, you know, yeah, and it's it's not something I'm 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 super familiar with. Uh, uh, you know, you, you you kind of you know hear about these these you know the arguments that take place about um, you know it, it, I think one of the you know the primary issue that, that the native corporations have always faced uh, is basically you know the, the, the I think the fundamental uh, tension between a, a subsistence culture. Uh, which uh, Alaska Natives throughout the state have, have, have tried in various ways to, to maintain, uh, and the, the kind of demand, the profit demand of, of the corporation. I mean, this, uh, when, when the, the Native Claims Settlement Act was established in 71, it, it kind of um, 
uh, you know, it had a, a sort of permanently transformative effect on Alaska Native culture and and uh, uh, and, and economics uh, because they, they they're working within this corporate framework, and it wasn't a corporate framework that was necessarily imposed on them from the outside. I mean, this, this was a process that Alaska Natives participated in, but it but it still, uh, I think, I think creates a lot of uh, a lot of tension. Um, now, does the state make any attempt to? Oversee them, or, or, or and, and, I can't. And, and I can't recall the precise. Uh, I, I mean, obviously, you know, the the, uh, the the land that they control is. I mean, that's that's their that's land. It's private private land, uh, and they're free to, to develop it and do what they want with it. Um, which uh, you know, given the the environmental politics of the state, sometimes provokes a confrontation between uh, Alaska Native corporations and uh, uh, you know, sort of white environmentalists. Uh, who uh, don't necessarily approve of you know, some of the the, uh, the resource extraction policies that some of these companies have, have taken? Uh, so it makes for a very strange. Oh, sorry, my cat. Right, right. Liberal liberals want to be liberal on the score of being an environmentalist, but then find themselves dumping on Native American Native peoples. Yeah, not really dumping, so but just. Uh, I mean, I, I think that okay. that. Uh, well, I mean, there's a tremendous amount. Of, there's a tremendous amount. Opposing. Amount. I mean. Yeah, yeah, and it. it I think. I think it, it does. It, it certainly does create some, some tensions. I mean, you know, the Native uh, uh, Alaska Native population. Uh, uh, you know, like like all Indigenous people in North America. I mean, they they, they got a pretty raw deal um, over over the long haul, and um, uh, and, and so of course they. Uh, Bear some pretty well placed, um, uh, pretty well placed sense that, that uh, it's it's not appropriate for for white Alaskans to tell them what to do with the land that they they have. Um, are, are, are the natives identifiably Republican or Democrat, or both, or either? Or, or I, I don't have the data. Do they vote? I mean, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, very very powerful. Uh, the the Alaska Native Brotherhood. And Alaska Native Sisterhood, which are these old progressive era organizations going back to the World War One era. Um, I mean, they played a very important role in, in Alaska's political history. Uh, I, my my sense is that you know, like the rest of the state, uh, the, the the sort of Native political preferences are very regional, uh, very sectional. I think in Southeast Alaska, it's fair to say that the uh, uh, preponderance of Alaska Natives are, are probably Democratic, uh, because that's kind of where the 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 region itself trends. Uh, I think in other parts of the state, um, you know, it, 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 it's going to look uh, it's going to look different. Um, uh, and we've got you know quite a number of, of Republican uh, representatives. Well, Todd, Todd Palin. I mean, I mean, is, is Todd Palin? I mean, is it is? But you always sort of hear that he's part. I, you pronounce the name right, and I won't even try. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, it's interesting. I've, I've I mean, is he, is he, is he, does he own a native corporation? I mean, is he part of a native I, I corporation? Don't, I he? don't know the details of that, and that's one of the things that's really interesting. I, I, I think he's like one quarter or one eighth. I can't recall the, the the ratio. You know, to what extent that really really matters? Who, who can say? Um, but it's never been discussed. As a, I mean, people, people don't bring it up and say this, this is why he holds this view or represents that. No, like that. no, no, no. I don't. Yeah. I don't think so. Um, uh, yeah, he's kind of an enigma. He's one of the, the sort of interesting sort of facets of this whole whole process. Not, I mean, he's he's a very important part of Palin's administration. Uh, he's a, a, kind of her informal chief of staff, but we really don't know a whole lot about him uh, aside from from what you hear through the the, the rumor mill. Um, but uh, uh, you know he's not been been terribly, you know, sort of vocal um, in, in this campaign. <laughs> I think he gets up and says a couple words at rallies and then moves on. But uh, but yeah, he's a, he's an interesting character. We just don't okay. know that. Much right, very good. <laughs> <laughs> well, so how do you think Palin will do in the debates? In well, the debate singular, I guess. Well, so. you know, this is the thing. You know, this this what's been going on with the press in the last couple of days. Uh, uh, I think that there's not to be overly snarky, but I think that there's there's a good reason that McCain uh, and his his campaign folks have been keeping Palin away from the press. I think it's I think it's in their interest to do it. Uh, they can continue to um, kind of hammer away this idea that the press is mean to her. Uh, which I think energizes a lot of her her supporters, um, the sense that the press uh, shouldn't be allowed access to her because they uh, you know, supposedly fumbled the ball during the first couple of, of, of days after her nomination. Uh, the press has treated Palin really lightly up here until the Troopergate 
uh, investigation. And she's, she's never had to face tough questioning. If you listen to the, the primary debates and the, the you know, gubernatorial debates in 2006, uh, she wasn't particularly good. Uh, but neither was anybody else, uh, and and I think that. that uh, so she, I'm saying she wasn't. I mean, because the impression you have is that she's a good talker and that she's you know sort of intense and smart and stuff. I mean, I well, mean, okay. I, 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 as governor, you know, when she gives press conferences, for example, uh, uh, when she, you know she meets with with uh, with, with people, um, you know, she's surrounded by staffers, uh, and uh, you know, folks folks who are, are uh, kind of willing to be unkind about it, uh, will say like they don't think that she's she's particularly strong um, on a lot of issues. Uh, that she doesn't she doesn't know a lot about uh, uh, you know some of the issues that she she has to deal with. And so I think that it's possible that she could do really badly. I, uh, the question, of course, is well, how much is that going to matter? Uh, you know, the, the data on on uh, you know debate bumps is like. It doesn't suggest that they really have much of an effect, and and the vice presidential debates don't don't seem to matter, uh, you know, uh, even even close to what what the presidential debates would, would count. For. Well, of course, the conventional wisdom of one time is, is out the window the next time. You know, we we it was, the rule was we weren't supposed to elect senators, and now we're guaranteed to elect a senator. And yeah. the rule was that whatever the status quo, the political status quo is on Labor Day is what sticks through the election. And of course, that changed too. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you know, these iron, iron laws are just sort of Suckers waiting to get broken. Right, right, uh, you, you just, right. You just never know when. Yeah, and, but I mean, uh, you know, you know, she uh, opens her mouth and, and says things. Like, I'm reading this 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 quote here, uh, you know, from uh, this town hall thing they did the other day, and she said, you know, oil and coal. Of course, it's a fungible commodity, and they don't flag, you know, the molecules where it's going and where it's not. You know, gobble gobble, gobble gobble. No, we accept her. I mean, this this kind. Of, it, it was it was a, a, I think a bad moment for. This is her talk. This is her talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About fung fungible commodities. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It was it was an, uh, the, the Hillsoy um, at, at Washington Monthly uh, was about the only person I could find who was able to decipher this. And basically, what Palin seemed to be suggesting was that the U.S. shouldn't export its oil. That the oil that, that we we get from coastal drilling or, or from Anwar or from wherever should go to American markets first. But you look at the data, as she did, and, and you see that the U.S. exports to Canada and Mexico, um, you know, about a third of what we get from them. So, you know, cutting off oil exports is just a really bad idea. But it, but I think it, it suggests it, it, it kind of fits in with that 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 thing of, of Palin, where it's, you know, Alaska first, or you know, even the McCain campaign slogan, "Country first. Well, that's that's like a, that's a really bad policy if you're talking about. You know the, the the global market for oil. It's not it's not even a coherent policy. So so I mean I think if, if she if she does stuff like that, um, uh, it, you know it could be sort of a you know Dan Quayle Lloyd Benson thing. But then again that well, didn't seem to matter. You know. <laughs> oh I think it did. I worked in that campaign. I think it did. Uh, uh, I mean it probably cut, clipped a couple two or three points off the of book. Yeah that's true. Actually I, I, I have I have heard people say that. So yeah. I'll, 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 what what do you think will come of the Trooper Gate thing? I mean, Walt Monaghan and so on. Is well, I, up this is, this, it's and such a weird thing. You know, if Palin comes into office, she's got this, this you know, very compelling uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, persona as someone who's going to shake things up, someone who's not going to be as, as corrupt as her predecessor, open, transparent government, and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, um, you know, once this story broke, uh, you know, she started shutting down. I, I think it, it's incorrect to say that, that Palin began stalling or stonewalling on the investigation when she got tapped for vice president. She started doing this before, like two weeks before. Uh, it was clear in, in early to mid-August that she wasn't going to be um, uh, cooperating. Uh, I don't know what's going to come out of it. I mean, it, it looks it, it looks pretty, you know, pretty bad in, in some ways. Uh, whatever the, the merits of the the... the, the yeah, you know, the specific incident. Um, you know whether or not she fired this uh, commissioner because he wouldn't can her ex brother in law. Uh, I don't think that matters nearly as much as what what what's been sort of obvious since then, which is that she's she's not kind of living up to this this image that she uh, kind of created for herself. And I think that that uh, again, if if people actually care about what happens in Alaska, and if people try to you know 
connect that with with what we might be getting as a vice president, uh, I don't think it looks particularly good, right? Uh, this this whole kind of secret. No, I know. I, I certainly didn't. I, I mean, I, I think a lot of it is you know, these people who have sort of become somewhat neat, like Walt Monaghan and Holland French and you know Stephen Branch Flower. These, again, these are all exotic people that you know nobody down here has ever met, and so on. And, and you know, one, one I, the question I have is whether any of these people are going to turn up and, you know, I mean, if, if they come down to Washington to go to the press club and hold a press, you know, that, that's one thing. And if they sit up there as sort of, you know, names in a paragraph, you know, in the Washington Post, that's another thing. And, um, you know, I'm, just, I'm sort of curious as to which, you know, how, how fully this will develop in the next six weeks. So, of course, if she, if, if she doesn't win, you've got another two years to sort this out up there. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's two investigations going on. One of them she's cooperating with and one of them she isn't. The one she's not cooperating with is the one that, that the legislature set up by a unanimous um, legislative council vote, Republicans and, and Democrats alike. Uh, it's the one that she originally said that she would cooperate with. Uh, it's the one that, that the state, you know, the legislature has the power to do this. They can investigate anything they want. Um, and that's the one that, that Steve Branchflower, who's a very well-respected, nonpartisan, it doesn't even live in Alaska anymore, uh, former former prosecutor, he's been tasked with uh, uh, sort of conducting the investigation. Now, you know, some of the legislators have said some things that are, you know, uh, maybe a little bit un, you know, ill-advised, but uh, but the fact of the matter is that the investigation is, is not being conducted by them. Uh, that's the one that she's, you know, they've issued subpoenas. Um, the McCain's spokespeople have been the ones to say, you know, they're not testifying. They're not going to appear before the legislature. Uh, she's cooperating with the personnel board investigation, which is which is really, uh, you know, a, a total clown show. I mean, this is a board that's composed of people that she can fire at any point. They're all, you know, Palin appointees. Uh, the, the deliberations, the investigation never has to be made public. Uh, if the if the complaint is uh, found to be not worth a hearing, uh, none of the details of the complaint or the investigation ever have to be disclosed. Uh, it can just like you know trail off into a black hole. What's interesting is that Palin has complained about this process before. There was a complaint filed a couple years ago before she was governor, and you know she was out there advocating for you know this this process needs to be transparent. It needs to be done quickly. Uh, we need to find out the details of this. But now, of course, when, when the shoe's on her foot, uh, she's, she's uh, you know, uh, sort of all for the, the, the kind of slow, deliberative secret process. <laughs> well, uh, whose who ox is gored? It's nice to know that yeah, some yeah, things yeah, are, yeah. are completely universal in their, in their application. <laughs> yeah, but the, you know, the legislative investigation is going to be done, and they're, they're supposed to release their report on October 10th, which I guess is, what, a couple days after the vice presidential debate? I can't recall when mm-hmm. that's scheduled for. But, um, uh, but you know, they, they were going to, uh, uh, Palin's folks were going to, you know, kind of write this off as a partisan smear job no matter what. It, it didn't matter what Hollis French or anyone else said. They, it, you know, they would have objected to uh, you know, whether he, you know chewed his food with his mouth open or what color sweater he wore. It would have it, it, that was that was an approach that that Palin was going to take, whether or not she was uh, selected as Palin's VP. But obviously, the selection has kind of crystallized her opposition, and now she's got you know McCain campaign folks here, basically like running the governor's office. It's a very strange development. Uh, the state's been, <laughs> the executive branch has just kind of been taken over by McCain people. Wow. Um, I mean, it's, look, this, Dave, this is very interesting. We've gone over an hour, and, and oh, I don't want to tax anybody's patience or time, but, but certainly I, I've, I've enjoyed this. I've learned a lot. Uh, um, you know, this, this is uh, a window into, you know, it, 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 Ambrose Bierce, the famous uh, wit from the 19th century, said that you know, war is the devil's way of teaching us geography. <laughs> <laughs> you, you learn about Decrete and, you know, right, and right. Kandahar and wherever else. Yeah. Well, you should, um, you should come up here. Come up, come up to Juneau. I'll, I'll, I'll buy you a beer at the hangar, which is uh, overlooking. you got to come here on a day that's not raining, which is uh, a rare. Which is one, one day a year after Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Well, in any case, I mean, I think this is, this is a lot of fun, and, and uh, I, I hope that all of Alaskans, this is their, this is their chance to, you know, Bring a unique, yeah. you know. Yeah. I, I never saw the TV show Northern Exposure, which I, I in my life. And, and, uh, <laughs> no, well, um, you, you watch Ice Road Truckers now, apparently. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 
yeah, no, in, in a couple of week, you know, weeks, uh, you know, hopefully we'll all just sort of slip back into our, our you know, comfortable anonymity and my, my 15 <laughs> prosperous minutes. Prosperous an, an, pr- prosperous anonymity. Right, right, and my 15 okay. minutes of, of you know, relevance will be, will be over. Um, so. Anyway, Dave, th- thanks on behalf of Blogging Heads. Hey, thanks for, thanks to for us. having me. It's and uh, I, hope we, I hope our paths cross again, maybe down here somewhere. All right, I'll, 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 uh, okay. I'll keep you in mind. <laughs> thanks, Dave. Thanks, Jim. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.